In the comments under one of our previous videos about a common device, the capacitor, many people asked us to continue discussing the physics of electronic components. I'm happy to oblige, and today we'll talk about another ubiquitous component, the inductor. Inductors are widely used for various purposes in electronic and radio circuits, often alongside capacitors. So, since we talked about capacitors in the previous video, it's only natural to now talk about inductors. Physicists and engineers love winding wires into coils. Such constructions are widely used in various devices, primarily due to their ability to act as electromagnets, creating a magnetic field when an electric current flows through them. More precisely, any conductor with an electric current creates a magnetic field around it. However, in the case of a simple current-carrying wire, this field is usually quite weak and has an inconvenient shape. By coiling the wire, we achieve a much greater concentration of the field in space, making it similar to the field of a bar magnet. Therefore, if we need to create a strong electromagnet or generate a powerful magnetic field, we usually wind the wire into a coil of some form. Adding a core of ferromagnetic material inside the coil further enhances the field. How and why this happens will be covered in detail in a separate video dedicated to another crucial device based on coils, the transformer. Today we'll talk about what a single coil can do, with or without a core, because even a single coil can do quite a lot thanks to the phenomenon known as magnetic induction. The essence of magnetic induction is this. A changing magnetic field generates a circulating electric field in space, and if another conductor is in this field, the electric field will cause the electrons in this second conductor to move, creating an electric current. This electric current will also generate a magnetic field, directed opposite to the change in the original magnetic field. This is known as Lenz's law. So, if we take a conductor loop and place it in a magnetic field directed, say, upwards, and then increase this field, a magnetic field will be generated in the coil directed downwards. The direction of the magnetic field and the direction of the current are related by the right-hand rule, meaning that to create this magnetic field, as required by Lenz's law, the current in the conductor must flow clockwise. Conversely, if the external magnetic field decreases, the magnetic field of the current loop will try to oppose this process, meaning it will be directed upwards, corresponding to a current flowing counterclockwise. If the magnetic field is directed downwards, everything will be reversed. Increasing the field will cause the coil's magnetic field to be directed upwards with a counterclockwise current, and decreasing the magnetic field will cause the induced magnetic field to be directed downwards with a clockwise current. It's important to note that we're talking about the direction of the current, defined as the direction in which positive charges would move in the field. In real metal conductors, the charge carriers are negatively charged electrons, so the physical flow of electrons will be in the opposite direction. This is something to constantly keep in mind when discussing electromagnetic processes, so I took the opportunity to remind you once again. Until now, we have considered the external magnetic field as a given, but it must be created by something. Let's say it's generated by an electromagnet, that is a solenoid coil. Suppose we pass current through the coil from bottom to top so that it flows counterclockwise through its turns. Using the right-hand rule again, we can determine that the magnetic field created by this current will also be directed upwards. As we already established, in this case, increasing the current in the original coil will induce a current in the loop flowing clockwise in the direction opposite to the original current. Conversely, when the current in the solenoid decreases, thus reducing the magnetic field it creates, the induced current will flow in the same direction as the current in the solenoid. But the turns of the solenoid are also within the magnetic field they create, so the same principle applies to them. Each turn of the solenoid, being in the magnetic field created by other turns, will experience an electromotive force, EMF, of induction. This EMF, which appears when the current and magnetic field increase, will oppose the current, weakening it. Conversely, when the current decreases, electromagnetic induction will create an EMF that strengthens the current. Thus, a coil with a current will resist changes in the current flowing through it, 
similar to how massive objects resist changes in their speed due to inertia. This phenomenon is known as self-induction. You can also explain self-induction from another perspective. The magnetic field has a certain amount of energy. When we increase the current, the magnetic field created by the coil strengthens, increasing the stored energy in the field. During this process, some of the electrical current's energy is used to create the field, reducing the current's energy. Conversely, when the current decreases, the magnetic field weakens and the stored energy is returned to the system, increasing the current's energy. Therefore, the coil can store electromagnetic energy in its magnetic field. Imagine a circuit consisting of our coil, a light bulb, a constant power source, and of course, a switch to open and close the circuit. When we close the circuit, the power source will try to create a current equal to the voltage divided by the circuit's resistance, including the resistance of the bulb and the coil, as the wire of the coil also has some resistance. This means that over a brief period, the current in the circuit will increase from zero to its maximum value. As we discussed earlier, the coil will resist this change by storing some of the electrical current's energy in its magnetic field, creating a temporary EMF in the coil opposite to the source's EMF. This causes the current to increase more slowly than it would without the coil. The bulb won't light up immediately as it would in a simple circuit, but will gradually increase in brightness. Mathematically, this can be expressed as follows, where I0 is the maximum current voltage divided by total resistance, T is time, and tau is the time constant of the transient process, also known as the coil's time constant. This constant depends on the coil's parameters, which we'll discuss shortly. When the current in the circuit stabilizes, the coil's magnetic field will no longer change, and the self-induced EMF will be zero. In essence, the coil will no longer have any special effect on the circuit other than its contribution to the total resistance due to the wire's electrical resistance. Now let's remove the battery, keeping the circuit closed. The current in the circuit will begin to dissipate and our coil will resist this change with the self-induced EMF being in the same direction as the source's EMF. Thanks to the coil, the current will persist longer. The current's change over time will be described by the following formula. Now imagine our circuit is powered by an alternating voltage source, meaning the source's voltage constantly increases and decreases, causing the current to constantly rise and fall and never remain constant. In such a scenario, the coil will always hinder the current. When the source voltage rises, the coil will restrain its growth. When it falls, the coil will oppose its decrease. Therefore, the current in such a circuit will always have a lower, or more precisely, a lower root mean square value than in a circuit with the same total resistance, but without the coil, as if the coil added additional resistance to the alternating current compared to the coil's material's ordinary resistance. This resistance is called inductive resistance, in contrast to the material's usual electrical resistance, known as reactance. It shows what portion of the electric current's energy is used to create the alternating magnetic field around the coil. So, an inductor can store energy in the form of a magnetic field. When the current in the circuit changes, the inductor generates an electromotive force, EMF, that tries to counteract this change. The change in current is the cause, and the self-induced EMF is the effect, with the relationship between the cause and effect determined by the coil's parameters, specifically its inductance. Inductance indicates the EMF generated in a specific coil when the current through it changes. For long coils, where the length is much greater than the turn's radius, the inductance can be calculated using the following formula, where mu0 is the magnetic constant, mu is the permeability of the coil's material, n is the number of turns, s is the cross-sectional area, and l is its length. The inductance of a coil determines how it affects the circuit it is part of. For instance, the time constant of a coil, which we discussed earlier, is the ratio of its inductance to its reactance. The inductive reactance introduced by the coil into an AC circuit is given by this formula, where F is the frequency of the alternating voltage, or alternatively by this formula where omega is the angular frequency. 
It's not only wire coils that have inductance. Any conductor possesses some degree of inductance. Even a simple wire carrying an alternating current is subject to self-induction because each segment of the wire is in the changing magnetic field created by adjacent segments. This induces an EMF that opposes changes in the external voltage. Consequently, even a plain wire in an AC circuit will have additional inductive reactance, meaning its total resistance will be slightly higher than it would be in a DC circuit. This effect is usually minor, but it becomes significant with higher frequencies and longer conductors, particularly in high voltage power lines stretching hundreds of kilometers. The existence of self-induction poses technical challenges, but we've also learned to harness it beneficially, which explains the widespread use of inductors in electrical engineering. For example, the dependence of inductive reactants on frequency is quite useful. An inductor will allow low frequency or DC current to pass relatively unimpeded, but will significantly resist high frequency current. This makes inductors effective in filtering out high frequency noise from signals. However, inductors can do much more than that. Consider a standard power supply with an output voltage of 12 volts, but we need to power a device, such as a microchip, that requires 2 volts. We need to reduce the supply voltage to match the device's requirements. The simplest way is to insert a powerful resistor between the source and the device, converting the excess electrical energy into heat. This method is inefficient because it generates a lot of heat. For example, if our device draws 50 amperes, which is not uncommon in modern electronics, some processors require 100 or 200 amperes, the resistor would dissipate 500 watts of power. Not only would this waste energy and money, but it would also generate as much heat as a small electric kettle, requiring additional cooling to prevent the resistor from melting. Fortunately, we can achieve the same voltage reduction more efficiently using an inductor. Here's how. We connect an inductor in series with our device, and between the inductor and the power source, we place a switch, a special one that can quickly open and close the circuit at high frequencies. These regulators usually combine a transistor and a pulse width modulator, PWM, to control the transistor's switching. We set the switch to close the circuit for a time shorter than the inductor's time constant. During each pulse, the inductor won't fully saturate its magnetic field, so it suppresses the voltage from the source, which doesn't reach its full value before the switch opens again. When the switch opens, the inductor releases the stored energy back into the circuit, preventing the voltage from dropping to zero and decreasing it gradually instead. Before the voltage falls to zero, the switch reconnects the power source, repeating the process. This results in an output voltage that fluctuates within certain limits, never dropping to zero, but also never reaching the full supply voltage. All that remains is to smooth out the fluctuating voltage using a capacitor connected parallel to the load and a diode to prevent short-circuiting the power source when it is connected to the circuit. This setup avoids wasting excess electrical energy by using it in controlled portions and distributing it within the system. While some energy will still be lost due to the resistance of the system components, these losses will be significantly less. Such devices are known as step-down DC-DC converters. Inductors can also solve the reverse problem of increasing the input voltage from a power source. This requires the same inductor and switch, but they are connected differently with the switch placed between the inductor and the load in parallel with the load. Let's turn the switch on. The resistance of the switch and the coil is generally much lower than the resistance of the load, so in this situation, the current will primarily flow through the coil and switch. This current will be quite large due to the low resistance of these components. When the circuit is activated, the coil will initially store energy in its magnetic field, slightly reducing the voltage and current in the circuit until the situation stabilizes. At this point, we open our switch, preventing the current from flowing through this path. The current then has no choice but to flow through the larger loop, which includes our load. Since the resistance of this loop is much higher than the first, the current in the circuit, including through the coil, will sharply decrease. We know how an inductor responds to a decrease in current, 
it generates an EMF that reinforces the EMF of the source. Thus, when switching to the larger loop, the coil will begin to increase the voltage in the circuit, effectively boosting the source voltage using the electrical energy stored in its magnetic field during the previous stage. After the short loop is cut off, the coil will create a voltage in the main circuit that adds to the source voltage, temporarily making the voltage across our load higher than the source voltage. Once the coil releases all the stored energy from its magnetic field, the voltage will start to decrease again, but our system will prevent this by reclosing the short loop, disconnecting the load, which will increase the current in the circuit and cause our coil to accumulate energy in its magnetic field again. As a result, we get a pulsed voltage across the load with peak values significantly higher than the source voltage. If the system parameters are chosen correctly, the voltage can be increased by tens or even hundreds of times. Although the load won't receive power half of the time, we can easily fix this by adding a capacitor in parallel with the load. When the current flows through the long loop, it also charges the capacitor. And when the short loop is closed, effectively disconnecting the load from the power source, the capacitor discharges, supplying power to our load. Additionally, we need to add a diode to prevent the discharge current from flowing back into the main circuit. This completes our device known as a step-up DC-DC converter. Finally, there is another way to use inductors. By connecting an inductor in parallel with a capacitor, we can create a resonant circuit, or LC circuit, which is essential in every modern radio receiver, among other applications. However, this topic deserves a separate discussion, so if my dear viewers are interested, we will explore it in more detail in our next videos. This is how induction coil works. This relatively simple device, essentially just a coiled wire, contains fascinating physics that clever scientists and engineers have found many useful applications for. So if you think physics is something abstract, detached from life, and incomprehensible, you might want to reconsider. In our future videos, we will continue exploring the practical applications of various physical phenomena. But as for today, that's all. So take care, and until we meet again,